Hello, everybody. I'm Laurel McCard, host of Alligator Preserves, and I am here today with a really special guest. And it's especially a special because I am in his shop. This is John Cameron. Hi. Hi. Hey, thanks. <laughs> thanks for me coming to your shop. John is the owner of Salida Books, formerly known as The Book Haven. In Salida, Colorado, downtown Salida, Colorado. Right on F Street. And it's a gorgeous day here, and the shop is closed. But we'll see. If someone comes to the door, we're going to let them in. You're going to make a sale, right? If you'd like me to, I have the door locked and signs up. So, <laughs> so today is Monday. What was business like in Salida on a Monday in July? Uh, business has been really good. Uh, it's been a great summer. We've had a lot of people in town. Our summer traffic is mostly tourism, and that makes the difference. Um, we do enough business throughout the year to keep the store open, but it's really the summer traffic that makes all the difference. And summer is our big high season. July is really good. And since taking over the bookstore last year at the beginning of 2020, um, we're up thousands of percent. <laughs> it's just last year. And, and very exciting. Yeah, so, last year was a hectic year to take on a business uh, like a bookstore. Um, like anything, know, I bet. Like anything. Everyone had a crazy year last year. But seeing this year um, with a lot of people back in town, it's been really great. I'm going to take you way back, way back yep. to when you were a wee tot. You yep. were a little boy. And in your mind, you thought, someday I'm going to own an independent bookstore, right? So that thought definitely crossed my mind, but I never anticipated actually acting on that thought ever, right? It was just kind of a thing that I've always thought would be really fun, really cool. When you were little? When you were younger? Well, of all the things I could imagine being uh, exciting or fun, yeah, you know, but it was never like a dream that I had pursued. You know, I, I was an English major in college. Uh, literature and uh, writing was always something that was interesting to me. The thought of working at a bookstore kind of seemed cool too, but it was never an early dream that I had ever anticipated. Um, you know, and so that it just just never filled that square until the opportunity and, presented itself. Until it did. Until it did, yeah. Were, were you a prolific reader as a boy? No, mm -hmm. no, no. It wasn't until I was a little bit older uh, in college that I got a little bit more into, into reading. I didn't read as a young kid. Um, it wasn't like a big, it wasn't a big thing growing up. What was the first book you can remember reading that, that affected you somehow? Um, it was actually just like, like self-published zines, magazines, like from record stores, music okay. stores. All right. Right. And the thing that was so intriguing about those is that it was just average, normal people making them themselves. And that made this whole idea that it's just normal people doing normal things, you know, cause like a book, you know, you, you read like a classic, right. And classics are on a pedestal and they seem hard to reach or out of touch or this thing that just like, you know, exists, you know, before you, but knowing that like, there's people that were my age that were just making basically zines, you know, and like printing them off by hand. Um, knowing that literature is that accessible was kind of what really got me into it. And then from there I started reading all the books that you read in your 20s, you know, that that are meaningful, like The Alchemist or something like that. So you opened this bookstore right before the pandemic yep. and you're still open. And yep. every time I come down to town and look, either come in or walk by, this place is packed. How did you manage to stay open during the pandemic? So it turns out that pandemics are not incompatible with uh, reading. You know, people had a lot of time to read. People had a lot of time to spend off of their screens because you're suddenly working remote and you're on your screen all day long. Um, you know, reading a book in the evening rather than watching Netflix after everyone had finished Netflix, you know, um, started to become like a, a real pastime again. And uh, at one point I did Google, I'm like, what, you know, what's the biggest thing that people are into this year? And it was reading. It was like watching shows on Netflix and reading had a big moment. Um, and puzzles and, don't and puzzles, puzzles of Jigsaw course puzzles. yeah jigsaw puzzles also had a moment and you know so people kind of retracted back to to reading and i think it definitely had a moment where it did fit um one thing that stood out to me was that um um eric larson wrote the book the splendid in the vial about the um the bombing of britain during world war ii you know like the blitz right um they kept bookstores open during that whole thing you know, it was like the worst thing that you could imagine happening is your country just getting bombed. 
uh, incessantly, people were reading. They were sitting down in their basements, you know, with the lights out, you know, under candlelight reading books. It was something that got people through a really trying time. And I think books were able to get people through a trying time. Uh, and I never would have asked for it to be that way. It just happens to have been that way. Uh, and, you know, not a bad business to, to be in if I had to choose, you know, three or four to pick during a pandemic. And I see you have a bike outside and I've seen you on the bike. Mm -hmm. I think you might've used that at some point. Were you, were you doing like an Uber book? So shortly after we opened the bookstore, we shut it right back down. And um, it was just a matter of throwing everything out that would stick. And one of the things was delivering bikes. You know, people were books. closed in. Books on yep, bikes. Yeah, books, yeah, <laughs> delivering, delivering books, books on, on bikes. bikes. And um, yeah, so I was riding around town with a, a load of books in the bike basket and uh, delivering books to people who had ordered basically from Instagram, from TikTok, from, from anything online in town. As long as you're in town, I'd, I'd bike a book to you. So that was a fun thing that uh, kind of got us through. But selling one book a day, two books a day is a hard way to run a physical business, especially because when we opened the business, we wanted it to be a place that was physical, right? With like shelves that you can browse, uh, people that are here, a place to come. And as soon as that was off the table, it was, yeah, there's definitely a panic mode. So you kept the doors open and, yep. <laughs> and yay. And this is such a special shop. You have so many different things. So we're going to take a tour in a bit, but I'd like to talk to you about the first book that you wrote, sure. right? So this is Ski Patrol in Colorado yep. and you co-wrote it with Eric Miller. Mm -hmm. uh, why, why this book? So I spent 10 years working at Ski Patrol, you know, doing the outdoor, the seasonal work. And uh, at one point, Eric Miller and I were working on the mountain, just telling stories in the top shack. So in between job tasks, you have a little bit of time. And um, so you kind of sit around, we're just telling stories. It's like a lot of work like that, where you work really closely with people. And he's like, man, there's so many crazy stories that come out of Ski Patrol. There ought to be a book about it. And I was like, yeah, I'll just write the book. There's, there's not a book that exists that does this yet. And so, uh, so let's do it. So we chose to write the book, um, Ski Patrol in Colorado. So we went and gather, I, we collaborated on this idea, but I spent a lot of time visiting uh, a lot of different ski areas because I was um, a part of the Ski Patrol, had some really good connections to um, the industry and was able to go visit a lot of places and collect a lot of stories. And we physically were going through drawers of photos shot back in the nineties on Polaroid, um, and awesome all kinds photos. of stuff that were just in shoe boxes and in, in desk drawers. And it was fun to kind of rummage through some of that old history because the history of this industry is changing. Um, there was a time kind of through the 60s, 70s, all the way into the 90s where you could do this as a career full time. And that's changing a lot. It's a much more seasonal thing. It's kind of like a get your kicks after college kind of thing now. Um, and so a lot of that old guard was changing and we wanted to capture as much of that as we could, uh, while well, we could. So it's like photojournalism. Totally. Yeah. And yeah. that, that really fed a lot off of the background that I had working for uh, newspapers and magazines and stuff. So. And what I love, I, I bought this and you wrote inside work hard, be nice to people. Work hard and be nice to people. Yep. And I'm wondering, did you, did you write that just for me? Because I, you wanted to tell me to be nice to people. Uh, or did you write this to everybody. There's a little bit of an author trick and, uh, you know, if you go personalizing books, there might be a few that you choose from. <laughs> you can't possibly reinvent every personalization. <laughs> so uh, it was personalized. It was. But it wasn't personal. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but I will treasure it always. And I will always. do my best to be nice to people. <laughs> That's right. Oh, uh, let's see. What's next? What's the best part, most rewarding part about owning an indie bookstore? And should we all go out and start owning our own indie bookstores? Don't own any bookstores in Colorado. <laughs> in Salida, that is, because that's taken. That's, that's taken, uh, absolutely, and to take it very well. What's the most rewarding part for you? Well, I would encourage people, if it's something that they feel that uh, interests them, to pursue that. No, but for you. For me? What has been the most rewarding part of all this? Uh, owning my own business is definitely the most rewarding part. Um, I, I got to the point, after working in seasonal work, that I really wanted to be in business for myself, and one of the ways was doing that. Um, was opening a store of some sort and knowing my interests, knowing my background, I would never get tired or bored of, uh, of owning a bookstore. There's 
an infinite number of things you could talk about because there's an infinite number of books that I will never even get to read. And I'll never get bored selling books, having discussions, talking just because the nature of the subject, right? Um, there's a lot of things I'd get bored selling, but books will never be one of them. And so that's why I was so drawn to opening a bookstore uh, just for the sake of being in business for myself. You know, and so that's the most rewarding part for sure is, uh, is owning your own business. And, you know, it can be nerve wracking at times in case there's a global pandemic, you know, and you're always working. You never really off because if the ship goes down, you're, you're the captain on the bridge. So you go down with it. Oh, captain. Oh, captain. <laughs> that's right. Craziest question anyone has ever asked you in here on a phone call or when they're in the, but, be, but before you answer that, uh -huh. those eyelashes, how, <laughs> why? I mean, this, it's not, it's not fair. I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Other crazy, craziest question you've ever been asked. <laughs> um, that, that's a pretty good one. Um, I don't think there's very many crazy questions. Um, sometimes I, you know, would encourage people if you enter a, a bookstore to take a look around because I took some effort to put little signs up. And, uh, you know, if you don't see the sign that matches what you're looking for, then maybe consider asking me. But I am also happy to tell you that there's the fiction, there's the nonfiction. Yes, we do sell used and new books. Yes. So I get those questions a lot and uh, I'm happy to answer them, but consider reading the signs first. You did a funny, like. a funny TikTok video recently. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, okay. but the TikTok video was about people calling you to ask if you're open. Yep. And I think that's part of the, uh, that's the nature of the world that we're in during a pandemic. Stuff is frequently closed, but typically when I get phone calls, uh, most of them are, are you so <laughs> how many books do you read every month? I finish a book, book a week. A book a week. Books. That and counts. Audiobooks count. Definitely counts, and I would never consider it not counting. So I'm always rolling an audiobook and I enjoy listening to nonfiction more than fiction. I prefer listening to nonfiction. So I'm rolling an audiobook, I'm reading a fiction book, and I usually have something else, a third book open at any given time. Do you finish every book you start? No. Not even close. I don't even finish audiobooks. If an audiobook's not doing it for me. What would make an audiobook uh, not good in, in your perspective? What if it has a really good story? Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that could make you stop listening? Uh, well, there's uh, there's a lot of books for a lot of reasons. And uh, that's because there's a lot of preferences, you know, and it's just a matter of preference. If I'm not digging or feeling the story uh, enough to, you know, pay attention, then could it, could it be the voice? Could it be the narrator? Oh, that's right. That's a really good point. Um, I don't know if I mentioned that to you, but that's a great question because I do prefer books that are just just read in like a, a narrator's voice mm -hmm. rather than voice acted. Oh. I don't know if you've come across audiobooks that are voice acted. Yes. Yeah. I find it a lot harder to listen to audiobooks that are voice acted than just narrated. And so I do prefer that. And I have occasionally inadvertently downloaded audiobooks that are voice acted. That's good to And know. I couldn't finish that. And so, you know, they do have a sample, right? You right. can sample the audiobook. Right. I do that more now. I used to just download it and expect to listen to it, but now I've got such a preference when it comes to that, that I'll sample it first. Okay. Listen to the 30 seconds to make sure I'm going to, to like the narrator. Huh. And the reason is, is that I speed it up. I, I do it the, the fast speed, so mm -hmm. the double time. Mm -hmm. And um, when you start voice acting on that, it's just, you can't, <laughs> You can't, you can't keep that's, it up. I guess I could slow enough. it down. No, I mean, that's, that's, that's good that to That keeps me on pace to keep my, uh, my reading up. So. so because you read so many books and you try to do a book a week, you started last year, I believe you started the 42nd Book Club podcast. Yep. Yeah. So I did a season uh, of the 42nd Book Club, which is the podcast that I made for the bookstore. Um, and I decided to do it seasonally because summers, like I've said, are a really busy time for us. And... Uh, winters are not. So I have a little bit more time uh, in the shop to read and, uh, and work on some things like that. It was something that kind of came around last year when I was just trying everything. That's when I started the TikTok page. I started a podcast. I started uh, a blog somewhere uh, where I just talk about books, you know, because people were not coming into the store at the frequency that I wanted them to, to talk about books. So I just talked about books and put it on the internet. 
Um, the 42nd Book Club kind of came out to that, and it was just me talking about a book that I had read recently, and I did it in 40 seconds. And the reason was, that's how long it takes me to read a 100-word script. Um, and it's a, a form of micro-podcasting, which isn't super popular that I can tell. I'm kind of banking on the fact that it might someday become popular. Well, yeah. if anyone can make it popular, you can, because you have, what are you up to? I think over 48,000 TikTok followers. Yeah, so I've got quite a few on TikTok. And TikTok is that same format. It's the 30-second format, the 60-second format, and you can do uh, longer up videos to, up now. Up to three minutes up now. To three minutes now. Yeah. Uh, I don't record three-minute videos very often. I really like the 30-second, 60-second format. And so the 40-second book club is exactly that, just in audio form. And so it's the same format is uh, is what what works on TikTok. So, your TikTok and all your other accounts are at Salida Books. It's all at Salida Books. It's all at Salida Books. Yep, it's fabulous. So that podcast um, brings me to mind about an, another podcast that we listen to sometimes. It's called What You Will Learn, mm -hmm. and it's a couple of Australian blokes, yep. and they read a book a week, mm -hmm. and they do long form podcasts. Sure, and they only do nonfiction. That's great. So I'm wondering if there's a book that you might recommend for them to evaluate. So they, I'll go with two, two okay. recommendations. The most popular nonfiction book that I sold all last year, and it's on track to be the most popular nonfiction book this year, is Braiding Sweetgrass. We're running to get a copy of it? I am running to get a copy of Braiding Sweetgrass. Yes, I'm going to have to buy a copy of it before <laughs> I leave the bookstore. Um, this is an indigenous woman's perspective on society as it currently is. She's also a uh, biologist. And so it's a really cool dichotomy when it comes to um, her perspective growing up um, in the scientific community and the indigenous community. This book is like from 2015 or so, 14 or 15, but it's, um, it's still making the rounds. It's really pertinent today. And it's one of those books that leaves you really kind of hopeful in the end. Um, hopeful is good. Hopeful is good because there's a lot of nature writing out there um, that is pretty apocalyptic feeling. But this is a really good way to try to internalize a lot of the things that we are experiencing now through um, climate change, society, and even a pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, Braiding so Braiding Sweetgrass is a really good one. I recommend it. I loved it. Um, what else? The other one is totally just a book that I read and really enjoyed and it was called Midnight in Chernobyl and it's about the Chernobyl incident. It was uh, published I think in 2019 by a British guy and it tells in great detail the Chernobyl disaster which was just like a background thing that happened in my life. I was really young when that happened. It was 86 and um, I just knew that it had happened but I didn't know the story and the story was really fascinating. It's a good narrative and on every single page I learned something about like nuclear physics um, the USSR and human nature. I just thought it was great. So I keep recommending that one, but that was just a good narrative. So two you nonfiction. To audiobook. Uh, to the audiobook? I read those both. Actually. Oh, you read them both? Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. So, yay. Well, I think we need a tour of your shop okay. to show everybody what makes your shop so special. Yep. Right? Yeah. Take me on a tour. So I'm, I'm giving the tour here. Is that how it's going? Yeah. Well, you found me on a day where I was in the middle of rearranging all kinds of stuff during uh, the work day. It was a really busy day at the store, but I also took on the, the task of rearranging a lot of stuff. Um, happens all the time. But anyway, you come in, I've got um, use fiction, use nonfiction down by the ladder, and then start breaking out into like different subgenres, if you will. Science fiction, fantasy. This is all my local history kind of here in the middle. We got Colorado history as well as the West guidebooks and things like that. Colorado history and local history is really important to a small indie bookstore. It's something that we can sell really well, you know, that's super pertinent to us and only us. And you so, have a local historian? Uh, yeah, we do have a local, uh, a local author. He's our best-selling local author. Steve Chapman writes a lot of books about local slide of history. Nice. What is this? So here you will see it's a uh, Chandler and Price 1910 letterpress. This is a, um, a letterpress that was used in a newspaper in a ghost town in northern Colorado uh, at the turn of the century. It ended up sitting in Fort Collins for several decades. And then the previous owner of this storefront here uh, used it to make stationary uh, wedding invites and 
printed goods, all kinds of printed stuff, printed material. She has an identical machine to this one and uses it elsewhere uh, in town and still does that. This has kind of become a parts machine and is a display piece Very since cool. uh, it's no longer in use, but it's a really cool machine. Um, I've got some of the old lead type um, where you would place, you place the lead letters, you know, into the, into the rack and they're tiny, man. So they, um, that old saying, mind your P's and Q's, because all of these letters are upside down and backwards, or at least backwards when you put them into the machine. So that when it prints, it prints on the. Um, That's where that expression the comes from. And so the mind P's and Q's, when you're, when you're stacking your P's and Q's in there, a P looks a lot like a Q. And when you're trying to, in your head, switch it on the, on the lead types so that it's proper on the page, it's a really easy mistake to make. Did you drop a P or a Q? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I dropped, looks like a letter in. <laughs> okay. So hey, actually you. these, these were only left behind. I swept these up in the cracks of the floor. So that's how I found those. Oh my goodness. Year, so they're just kind of strewn about. You've got children's book section back children's there. Children's in the corner uh, in the midst of a rearrange um, and then chaos in the back. But chaos in the back. That's part of a, a small indie bookstore is um, a little bit of chaos, a little bit of clutter kind of suits my my style, my aesthetic, I guess you would say. Yeah. And we have local authors. Yep, we have local More authors. local authors. Here you'll find Laurel McCarg. Got and some of mine. We have a strong local author writer scene. Um, lots of memoir. Kiss. We have um, the Sasquatch series by L.V. Ditchkiss. We've got all kinds of stuff here. Because everyone writes something different, right? Carrie Uncleback's book. Lots of book. Nice. Lots of people. And all right. This I love. Little bookstore soap. Is that what you're looking book at? Bookstore scent. Yes, yeah, so a bookstore scented <laughs> soap. Thanks to my mom. She got into soap making. For a bookstore, so, uh, and, also there. and you've got other local artists' work up here too. Sure do. One of our uh, local artists, Andrew Tingate. We actually patrolled together a couple years ago. He uh, is a full-time artist working on a Salida, and uh, he keeps me well stocked on his art. So nice, nice to have. A, uh, he's my artist in residence this year. I think next year we'll do another one, but uh, he keeps the whole thing kind of filled with the art, and it's a really great fit. John, is there anything else you would like our listeners to know about your shop? Um, Other so than it's fabulous. It's a, it's a great, it's great to have an indie bookstore. It's a, reading is not dead. Bookstores are not dead. They still have a lot of life left to them. There's a lot of like young readers and I get people of a certain age to come in and remind me that bookstores are all closing, but I don't think that's true because there is so much interest in reading. Um, from young people, especially, you know, so there's a lot of, a lot of energy there. Um, and again, I think there's a lot of nostalgia that comes with books, you know, because the Kindle and the eBooks, they have their place, but people get really nostalgic for books, especially when times get weird. Right. And so there's totally been a, a, an interest in, I would call even a resurgence in, in books and book collecting and, I think it's just a really great space. It's a really fun place to be. And I think there's, um, there's a big future in, in reading, writing, and selling books. That is very encouraging. Warms my heart. John Cameron, owner of Salida Books. Yep. Thank you very much for visiting with us. And you'll see me a lot this summer. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Thank you.